I, I believe all of you will get the new issue of National Review that that uh, as the cover story is is really about my theory, but also about Gale's theory, and uh, and uh, Gale is. is has uh, really been critical to my thinking on uh, a wide range of subjects. He's a professor of economics in Hawaii. I don't know how you get to live in Hawaii and be a professor and, uh, and write great books and think new ideas. But uh, welcome, Gail Pooley. I'm not the greatest professor in this room. Uh, George is the greatest econ professor in this room. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. Um, you know, when Buzz Aldrin uh, went to the moon in July of 1969, he carried along one of these, uh, his trusty uh, slide rule. And uh, at the time, you could buy one of these for about $10.95. And uh, people were earning back in 1969, <clears throat> Typical blue collar worker was earning about $3.72 an hour. So you worked about three hours, you could buy one of these. So <clears throat> if we think about this, uh, today, uh, because of our friends across the street here, uh, you can buy uh, one of these for about $832. Uh, people are earning about $32 an hour, so it takes about 26 hours to buy one of these. This device will, uh, the GPU in this thing runs about uh, 12 teraflops. So you do 12 trillion calculations. So for the uh, time that it took you to, uh, uh, you get one, one calculation per second, you get about uh, uh, 12 trillion calculations per second uh, today. So we really have this, uh, this abundance of, you can think of it as, we've got this abundance of slide rules that, that, that have appeared. Now Moore's Law suggests that you can double uh, things in 12 to 24 months. Uh, a slide, the, the slide rule to the Xbox uh, rate has been doubling every 15 months, uh, or an increase of about 71% a year for the last 52 years. Now, in the movie um, Infinity Wars, Thanos says, <clears throat> it's simple calculus. The universe is finite, its resources finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correcting. Now, after listening to Neil and Peter this morning, I think maybe, uh, maybe Thanos was an optimist. Uh, <clears throat> but in a sense, Thanos is right. Uh, there are a fixed number of atoms, really, on this planet. Uh, but economics is not about atoms. It's, it, economics is about knowledge. Economics is not physics. Economics is about how we, <clears throat> how we create value for one another. And, uh, and it's the value of things that count, not the quantity of things. We measure economically, not physically. <laughs> now, George's information theory of economics stands on these three principles. Uh, first is wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. Now, let's talk about time, this last principle. Money is time means, uh, time essentially means, uh, or, uh, Money is time essentially means that we buy things with money, but we really pay for them with our time. Uh, it means that instead of dollars and cents, uh, we can use hours and minutes to price things. We can use time prices. Uh, William Nordhaus, a Nobel Prize winning economist, wrote this beautiful paper about the time price of light. And he goes back in time uh, and looks at the price it cost, it, uh, how much time you had to devote to earn enough money to buy light. Uh, just going back to 18, uh, 1830, it required about three hours of work to be able to earn the money to buy one hour of time. Well, today with the most advanced LED technology, you can buy uh, an hour of time for 0 0.16 uh, one of a second, an hour of light for uh, less than uh, 0 0.16 one sixteenth of a second of time. So we've had this tremendous abundance of light. It represents about a... <clears throat> Uh, on an individual basis, we have about almost uh, 6.7 billion times or a uh, million times more light today than we did in 1830. Now, if you multiply that personal abundance of light 
uh, by the population. Remember, we only had, what, 1.2 billion people in 1830. Today, we've got 7.8 billion. So we've had this increase in population, and this you combine it with the increase of light, uh, we end up with about 43 uh, million percent uh, increase. Uh, actually, that's the wrong number. It's 43 billion. 43, is that right? Yeah, 43 billion uh, million percent increase. You do the math. I, uh, but the, the point is, is we've been increasing about 7% a year in this light abundance. And this, this is happening all around us. A key, another key uh, thing that we look at is this um, resource abundance elasticity of population. In other words, when we add a percent to the population, what happens to this abundance? Every percent increase in uh, population corresponded to about a 79,000% increase in light. It's as if someone walked in the room here and said, look, I'll pay for everybody's tickets uh, to attend here and I'll pay for everybody's uh, airfare to come here. That's the kind of abundance that we, we've been enjoying with just this uh, marginal population increase. Now the time price is simply uh, the money price divided by your hourly income. Now, time prices have four advantages that we think about. <clears throat> the first advantage is it fully captures innovation. When we have an innovation occur, and an innovation is really this, this creation of, of valuable uh, knowledge. When we have an innovation that occurs, it, it not only lowers prices, it increases uh, people's incomes. So you really need to consider both income and prices to fully capture what innovation is doing to your, uh, your standard of living. So it's capturing both of those things in one value. The second important thing is you remove all the subjectivity and, and contention associated with GDP deflators and CPI adjustments. You can go right to a time price and you, you avoid all of that contention uh, that deal with these uh, adjustments to monetary inflation. The third uh, value of a time price is you can go to any time at any place with any product. You can go back to France in 1850 and calculate a time price for a pound of sugar. And you can compare that time price to a price today or another product. So it gives you this uh, ability to compare uh, different products across time and space. And then the fourth value of a time price is that it, uh, it's this, it, it takes things to this universal constant of time, this universal constant, and all measures really fundamentally go back to time. They go back to time. And time cannot be inflated. It can't be counterfeited. It is both fixed and continuous. And Steve, as Steve Forbes has noted, uh, central banks can print money, but they can't print time. So we argue that time prices are really the, two, the, the, two, the true prices uh, that we should be paying attention to. And uh, paraphrase the mind, uh, the great mind of, of Carver Mead, uh, we would say, listen to the time prices and find out what they're telling you, okay? Let's take an example of how this works. Um, a gallon of milk today, let's say it's $4, and you're earning $20 an hour, so it takes you about 12 minutes of time to earn a gallon of milk. If we go back to uh, 1980, milk was only $2 a gallon, but uh, average wage was $7 an hour, so it took you about 17 minutes to earn a gallon of milk. So the price has fallen for what? Fallen from what, about 29%? The other way to think about it is if you had spent 17 minutes today earning the money to buy a gallon of milk, how much milk could you get? Well, 17 divided by 12, that's 1.42. You would get 1.42 gallons, so the abundance of milk is increased by 42%. Now, as George noted, uh, the difference between our age and the Stone Age is is really this, um, uh, the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely due to the growth of knowledge, not the growth of atoms, not the growth of physical things, it's the growth of, of knowledge that's occurring. And we can measure knowledge with time. We can measure the growth of knowledge with time. <clears throat> Now, we're familiar with uh, these productivity gains in, in computer tech. We, we see this around us, and we're in this business, and we think about it. But what about other products, like uh, basic commodities? Is there any innovation occurring in wheat, or lumber, or cotton? Now, the World Bank actually tracks uh, the prices of a wide variety of commodities. We went back to 1980. They have pretty good data back to 1980. And we... Uh, <clears throat> 
We looked at 50 basic commodities from energy to food to materials, uh, minerals and metals. These include uh, crude oil to bananas, uh, lumber to wheat, copper to platinum. Now what we found is that the average time price had dropped by 75.2%. Now what that means is for the time required to earn the money to buy one unit in 1980, you would get 4.03 units today. So that's a 303% increase in abundance in these basic commodities. Now this occurred at the same time that population increased about 75.8%. It's kind of an odd thing we discovered that every 1% increase in the population corresponded to this 1% decrease in the time price. But it's, it's the uh, time price decrease. Remember, a percentage decrease is different than a percentage increase. So we convert that percentage decrease into this abundance factor, and then we multiply it times the population. So time prices go down by 75.2%. It means that for the same amount of time, you get 300% more. During the same period, population increased by 75.8%. So you take these two together, how much, is, how much is your personal resource abundance increasing, and then how much is the population increasing? In other words, the slice, size of the slice of your pizza, what's it doing, and then what's the whole pizza doing for the planet? And we combine those two together to get this overall measure of abundance, and it's indicating about a 608% increase in overall resource abundance with these 50 commodities. That's growing <clears throat> at about 5% a year. And what's also interesting is to note every 1% increase in the population corresponded to an 8% increase in abundance. It's like these new people coming and are bringing all this stuff with them. How's that happening? Uh, it's, it's a correspondence, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we start here. The first thing we look at is the time prices go down. And on the scale here is just a percentage change in over a year since 1980. So we see these time prices going down. And it's deceptive because a, time, a price can only drop 100% and then it's free, right? But the relationship between that percentage decrease and, and your abundance if it goes to free, it means it goes to infinity. So a 75% drop in the time price is a 303% increase in your personal abundance. And then we add to that this uh, change in population. Population has grown about 75% over the last 40 years. So you multiply that times the change in population, and that's where you get the 608 or so percent increase in abundance. So now, uh, Gordon Moore says that... Uh, suggested that computer density doubles every 12 to 24 months, indicating an abundance increase from, from 41 to 100% uh, <clears throat> a year. Now, remember that he wasn't talking about time. It's not a function of time. It was a function of quantity. The reason he observed this, he says, we're making chips at this rate of speed. It's a function of our learning over this period of time. The quantity of chips is what was important, not just time. Uh, <clears throat> So this chip manufacturing went from thousands to millions to billions to trillions, and that's really what we were observing is this, this learning curve that he was talking about. And um, we think about something like, uh, look at what it cost you uh, back in 2011, 10 years ago. Um, you go, to, you go to Blockbuster, it's going to cost you $4.99 for a movie. And uh, so it's costing you half of that for one hour of entertainment, $2.49. And that doesn't include the time it takes you to go pick up the movie and take it back and pay the uh, late fees. Uh, yeah, ouch, right? So the average unskilled worker in 2011 was earning about $10.40 an hour. So it took them about 14 minutes of work to be able to earn one hour of entertainment. <clears throat> Well, today Netflix is, what, $8.99 a month, and you have f access to 5,000 movies. You can stream 720 hours a month, right? You can stream every hour uh, of the day and night. So that puts the cost at about a, uh, 1.25 cents an hour. So you go from, from uh, <clears throat> that time, actually, we once again convert that back to the time price. So you go from from 14 minutes down to 3.35 seconds. So for the cost to get one movie 10 years ago, you get about 200 and, what is it, about 250 
50 movies for the same price. So once again, we look at the compound annual growth rate, and it looks like it's about 74, 75%. So we're on this, this same learning curve that we see happening. Now, as George notes, entrepreneurial creativity converts scarcities to abundances. Human intelligence and innovation transcend these limits of physics and atoms. Knowledge is not subject to these uh, thermodynamics. Now, we can measure the increase in knowledge <coughs> Uh, by the increase in abundance, but we can also um, uh, measure this increase in knowledge by the decrease in harmful things. Um, as uh, Bjorn Lornberg has, has shown, um, look at this chart of uh, climate-related deaths. He just published an update to this in the Wall Street Journal here a couple of days ago. Look at that, uh, that decrease. Yeah, uh, from 255 deaths per million down to 1.9. We have this 99.25 uh, percent decrease. Each year we're getting about 5% safer. Why is that? Remember, again, we got a lot more people, but we're a lot safer. How did that happen? <laughs> so um, he also notes, will there be, uh, will there continue to be dangerous climate and more deaths? Yes, but we must put these in, uh, these catastrophes into context with facts. Our ability to, ad to adapt and thrive under negative climate conditions over the last 100 years has really been astonishing. Look at that, uh, our ability to deal with uh, climate. Um, let's take a look at famines. Now, uh, death by famine has dropped by 99.8% uh, in the last 140 years. Our world in data reports that in the, 1870, the 1870s really represent this kind of worst decade of, of famine. Um, you know, we had problems in China and India and uh, suggest a rate of about 13,680, 618 per million population. But look what happened over the next 40 years from 1870. Sorry, that's not clear, but it looks like we've got this nice decline happening, right? Yeah, we have this nice decline. And then the Marxists and the Nazis showed up. So in the 1920, 1920s and the 30s, we see millions die in China and the Soviet Union, and World War II caused large famines across Europe and Asia. And there was a breather in the, in the 1950s, right? It looks like 1950, we kind of dropped, in the 50s, we dropped back down again. But then uh, Mao, uh, with his great leap, great leap forward, created the largest famine in history, killing about 24 million Chinese from 1958 to 1962. The Cambodian Marxists uh, starved another 1.75 million in 1979. Now, prior to the 1920s, uh, as noted here earlier, famines were, uh, were by and large due to these natural causes and our kind of our inability to react to them as, as fast as we, we can today. But take a look at that chart. Uh, 1850, we stood at 1.46 billion population. There's some people argue that the reason we have famines is population. But population has increased 400% to, well, the 7.34 in 2015. More people didn't cause famines, more Marxists caused famines. Um, you know, and, and <clears throat> You know, as, as Marxism has declined, we see this decline in famines as well. Uh, what would this chart look like without the Marxists and the Nazis and these other totalitarian governments? Now, the, the dash green line shows you where the trend was heading, right? Where was the trend heading? It was heading down. We have this kind of big burp that happened in the early uh, 1900s, but uh, th this, uh, this progress has really been phenomenal. Uh, now, Contrary to the thinking of Thanos and uh, some other, uh, other thinkers, uh, more people are really an insurance against famine. Innovation in food production, transportation, and communication systems allow us to identify and move food uh, to where people are hungry. We still have these natural disasters and totalitarian governments, but the threat of starvation has really almost disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> Here's a chart uh, showing solar panels. We, you know, we can talk about whether you know, it's a good idea or a bad idea, but look at the price of what's happening to the price of solar panels. Uh, we're seeing this 99% decrease in the price in just the last 43 years. Uh, that's clicking along about 13, 14% a year in terms of the compounded annual uh, abundance of uh, solar technology. 
Uh, <clears throat> batteries kind of see the same thing. Uh, really, in the last 30 years, uh, it's also indicating about a 14% uh, compounded annual growth rate. You can say what you want to about Elon, but, you know, I think he's put us on a learning curve here on batteries. This, this, this looks pretty good, right? I mean, he's focused uh, some attention there and some learning there, and we see that product of, of knowledge coming out of there. Um, a lot of us flew here today, right? Uh, well, there's a chart for airline safety, uh, airline deaths. It's really the rate of death that kind of ultimately counts, right? So um, look at that beautiful line. And the R square, 0.9968. Look what's happening there. A drop, you know, 95% uh, in the last 50 years. That's about 8% safer. I, do you know anybody that's died in an airplane accident, a commercial airplane accident in the last year or two, the last 10 years? Yeah, me neither. Okay, so we're enjoying this abundance of safety. Part of what happens when you get on a knowledge, uh, when you get on a, a learning curve and uh, you're able to enjoy this, uh, this, this knowledge that's being created. Now this guy, Thomas Selfridge, he was the first airplane crash fatality aboard a Wright Brothers test flight on September 17th, 1908. Now Orville was badly injured at the time. He suffered a broken leg and he had four broken ribs. And uh, a friend visiting him in the hospital said, um, said to him, has it got your nerve? And uh, Orville repeated slightly nerve. He says, oh, do you mean I will be afraid to fly again? The only thing I'm afraid of is that I can't get well soon enough to finish those tests next year. Now Wright knew that he had to get, on this learn get back on this learning curve in order to be able to create this flight abundance. Now how do we get cheaper and faster flights at the same time? By the way, air airline fares during this period have fallen by 50%. Boardings have increased by 1,300%. So we have this, uh, fares go down, boardings go up, and uh, safety goes up tremendously. How do all those things happen at once? Because every flight is an opportunity to learn something. And uh, we learn this from every flight. More passengers mean more knowledge, and more knowledge means more safety. Wealth is knowledge, and we are, uh, we're discovering knowledge and creating knowledge at faster and faster rates. <clears throat> Our uh, research was also inspired by uh, Paul Romer, and uh, he, he incorporated uh, explicitly this idea of, of knowledge creation in his economic models. And he says something interesting. He says, um, <clears throat> we'll come to understand uh, that knowledge is non-rivalrous and that we can start treating all people on the earth as potential collaborators and not rivals in discovering and creating true wealth for one another. Now, in uh, traditional economics, um, uh, the law of supply declares uh, that as prices go up, quantity supplied uh, will actually go up. Now, um, this is true um, as long as there's no learning. Now, uh, but every time a, an additional unit is uh, produced and acquired by a, a customer, Producers get better at making it, and consumers also get better at learning it, learning how to use it. So you have both consumers and producers that are learning together, adding to the knowledge base. So we see this in this idea of learning curves. Every time you can double output, you know the, you see the per unit cost fall between 20 and 30 percent. So it's this uh, phenomenal thing where we can invert the we can invert the supply curve. The more you make, the smarter you get. The smarter you get, the lower the prices or the, the greater the abundance that you can actually enjoy. All right. So in 1990, a goal was set to map the entire 3 billion letter human genome. Dr. Eric Green, who worked on uh, this project since its inception, has been the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute for more than a decade. And he noted the first genome costs us about a billion dollars. Now when we sequence a person's genome, it's less than a thousand dollars. So it's a million fold reduction. Now, uh, they track this uh, cost. And uh, notice the, the vertical scale is logarithmic and the solid white line is Moore's law. OK, 
okay? And look at, look at what they've experienced, kind of following Moore's Law, but they had this punctuated, uh, punctuated innovation that occurred when they actually discovered a, a, a new way to, uh, uh, from the Sanger-based method to this, what they call the second generation method. And look at that big, big drop that occurred there. Uh, now there's a group of Chinese entrepreneurs at BGI that hope to get the price down to $100, 100 bucks. Uh, using advanced robotics. Now, a blue collar worker in 2003 was earning about $21 an hour, so they would only have to spend uh, somewhere, what was it, about 46 million hours to be able to buy their genome. And today, if this happens, if you can really get it down to uh, $100, it's three, three hours. So that, uh, that abundance, the time price has dropped by 99.99999. 3%. So what it would cost to get one genome in 2003, you get somewhere around 1 point, uh, or 15 billion today. This is an example of probably one of the fastest learning curves in history that we're, we're experiencing right now. Uh, <clears throat> after Steve Jobs uh, introduced the, uh, yeah, it's about 129% a year is what that uh, compound and annual growth rate was. After Steve uh, Jobs introduced the iPhone back in 2007, he was persuaded. Remember when he first introduced the iPhone, he didn't want to have anybody else make any apps for it. He wanted to keep and someone persuade him, Steve, you really should have let other people come into this game because you don't know what they might come up with, right? So he was persuaded to open the platform. Well, uh, there's a new report. Uh, well, what George would say is it set off this effervescence of uh, Discovering Creativity, a new report uh, published by the uh, <clears throat> app analytics firm App Annie said the 2021 mobile app market is estimated to be $6.3 trillion, up from $1.3 trillion in 2016. Now, these figures represent income generated through the app store and other forms of monetization, such as in-app apps and mobile commerce. So from 2016 to 2021, the user base also doubled from 3.4 billion to 6.3 billion. Now think about this, 80% of the planet has been mobilized to do what? Well, really think about it is we went from virtually nothing in 2007 to 6.3 trillion in 14 years. That would be a compounded annual growth rate of about 720%. Now that's an exceptional example of a learning curve. But the knowledge that we can create with knowledge, it's truly astonishing when everybody on the planet gets on learning curves and uh, all of us, the rest of us, get to enjoy one another's knowledge. Now in George's book, Knowledge and Power, uh, in order for entrepreneurial creativity and sur um, surprise to thrive, right? It's the idea of surprise. And we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, we're trying to make this forecast into the future, what's gonna happen, we can model it. No, we really, really can't model it because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, we have this a surprise factor. Uh, what, what he argues there is that we need these low entropy, uh, low entre, uh, low entropy clear channels. And the, the, the big problem today, and I think uh, maybe Neil would agree, is that the noise in this channel is caused by governments. Government noise is preventing us from being able to, to have this clear channel where this high entrepreneur, uh, uh, high uh, entrepreneur, uh, George knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> we have to have this channel that, that, that is, it doesn't have noise in it. And um, if you have that order, then creativity can actually occur. Now, what we really should be thinking about, in my mind, Oh yeah, there's the, there's the app economy. It's 720% a year since, uh, since Steve Jobs introduced it back in 2007. Um, what we should, really should be thinking about is what is our rate of knowledge production per hour? And our ability to be able to discover new knowledge, to create new knowledge, uh, for acquiring it, for combining it, and, and ultimately for sharing it. Uh, it's doing this exponential curve right now. It's, it really is. Uh, <clears throat> so you might know this guy. Carver, I think, knows this guy. Um, Stephen Wolfram. Uh, 
did the uh, Mathematica program. He released this uh, program called Wolfram Alpha here a couple of years ago. He's got t 10 trillion uh, pieces of information, data that he's put in there. And he's got Mathematica with this data. So it's like a real smart version of Google that does math for you. And you can get a free version or you buy the pro version. It costs you 18 cents a day. So this phenomenal ability, once again, to be able to have access to knowledge and be able to think about how do I create new knowledge. Um, new guy here last week, uh, Carl Malamud. He released a, a file, 38 uh, terabytes, 107 million journal articles. And he's gone in and uh, taken all those articles and created 355 billion word and, word and sentence fragments. And, uh, you know, for what, $1,500, you can buy a 40 terabyte uh, drive and put 107 million journals on there that you can do searching on it. So you got those products. You've got uh, this new phone that uh, Google and um, uh, Indian uh, GeoNet have, have produced, $87 in India. India makes about, you make about $5 an hour in India. So it takes about two days to earn and the money to buy one of these phones. It's equivalent to the US of about $500. But get this, their uh, internet access price is five cents. Um, I think it's five cents per, where's my number? It's five cents, hang on a second. Five cents per gigabyte versus a dollar per gigabyte in the US. So it's 20 times cheaper to access. So you give everybody access to these files, this data, you give them the, uh, really the analytical tools, you give them a phone, and you say five cents an hour, go for it. Get on, find yourself a learning curve and go learn something. And then we'll take it to the market and see if it's valuable or not. All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> anybody know this house? The address? Yeah, <clears throat> 2066 Chris Drive in Los Altos, California. Are we running late? Yeah, okay, 30. Uh, Hang on a second here. Um, this is where these two Steves went from zero to one, right? Uh, they actually went from zero in 1976 to 2.5 trillion in 45 years. The same year, 76, is when our friends across the street, uh, Bill and his friends, started Microsoft. 76, kind of this key year, and I kind of feel like, you know, what's similar about 1976 and 2021? If you were around in 1976, it didn't feel very good. It feels a lot like it feels today. So <clears throat> William Nordhaus also made another important contribution when he talked about what percent of new innovation do producers actually keep and who gets the rest. And he said that uh, producers keep about 2.2% and the consumers get the rest. It's like taking a pie, cutting it into 44 slices and giving your consumer, your customers, 43 of those slices. Yeah, so if that's the case and the market value of Apple is the present value of all future benefits, then uh, an Apple that's worth 2.5 trillion today is really produced 111 trillion for every person on, uh, for the rest of us. And that's about $16,000 per person. Now what, um, that might seem like a, that's a lot of money, Apple, but um, you know, I ask my students, and sometimes it's not what you pay for something that counts, it's what I have to pay you to not use it that really reveals how much it's worth to you. So when I ask my students, what would I have to pay you to give up your iPhone? I haven't found a student that's willing to do it for less than $5 million. <laughs> So 14, 15,000 might be a low value that they've created, right? For the rest of us. So here's the, here's the point is, uh, you know, um, do we have adversity today? Yeah, uh, but Adobe's got this great uh, statement. They say adversity is when the best of every human being shows up. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, remember <laughs> that uh, in 1996, everybody thought that Apple was doomed. Right? If you do a, a adjusted to the price, it was like 10 cents a share. Everybody thought Apple was doomed. And uh, when, when Jobs actually returned in 1997 after 12 years in the wilderness, he faced these daunting problems. You know, the innovating spirit of Apple was being ravaged by this pathogen of pessimism. <clears throat> and, and virtually nobody gave Apple <laughs> a chance, but Steve Jobs did. 
He said what? He had this vision about what he wanted to create for the planet, and he did not let things interfere with his vision. And, it, you know, it began to recover. <clears throat> now, remember that the, the, uh, the, the uh, he, he took charge, and the first thing that he did he, is he had to, he had to eject worm tongue from the building. Right? You remember the Think Different uh, commercial they did? You know, that commercial was really about Apple employees. It was directed to Apple employees, and it was what? Stop thinking like losers. You know, we're a great company. You, you, you've, you, we can become great again. And, uh, but it was very hard for him to actually accomplish that. Remember in 2002, that stock price of Apple, it fell by 90%. It fell by 50, what, 51% in one day? So a lot of work that he had to uh, take care of there. Uh, <clears throat> He introduces the, uh, the first iMac, 1998. Look, what, what, look what's happened there. Uh, a month after 9-11, he introduces the first iPod. And um, then we get the iPhone and then the iPad. You know, it became this, this organization that uh, just learned. They, they, not a computer. You know, remember they dropped the name Apple Computer? It's, no, it's not Apple Computer, it's just Apple. Because it's like, what are we? Well, we're a learning company. We're an innovation learning company. Look at what they're spending on R&D. You know, they're growing about 27, 28% a year in terms of their R&D spending. They're trying to figure out how to, how to uh, get new knowledge. Uh, now, as, as George has so eloquently described, we are doomed if we separate knowledge from power. You gotta read this book and understand this connection between knowledge and power. Now, the centralization of power in the hands of a tiny elite of experts and bureaucrats and politicians, from the knowledge and the minds and the hands of billions of creative uh, entrepreneurs is surely a recipe for disaster. We agree with Professor Ferguson. Go read his book, go to the bottom of page 383. And he says, <laughs> plagues do not halt progress if progress is happening. Um, and we see this progress all around us. Everywhere you look, Tell me something that's, that's actually becoming more scarce other than human beings, right? I just close with by saying, George has offered another message, and he said that the human capacity to defeat doom is infinite, that we should fear not, we should be of good cheer, <clears throat> and we should let our hearts be comforted by this knowledge that we have. And we, we must be the leaders that go forth and take this light to the world and restore ourselves to where we can lead with our ability to learn and grow. Thank you very much.